Well, we are getting ready for the 11th Assembly of the World Council of Churches. Christians from all over the world would come together to Germany. And of course, one of the major languages other people would use would be English. So we thought we would have a Bible study in English. Good that people who know English are here, but basically this is a text that is known to all of us. And therefore I thought we would allow the text to speak to us. I would just try to expose the text through fresh eyes because across the years, I'm sure we have had several, several Bible studies on the two sons. But today, as we look at it from the, from the eyes of the theme of the World Council of Churches Assembly, especially looking at God's love that invites us to reconciliation, we would just ask this question, you know, how important is this word reconciliation in a context in which we live, in a context that the churches are coming together? Bible studies, we should allow the Bible to speak. So that's what I'll basically do. And to aid us, I'll have some, some uh, PowerPoints uh, slides so that that would make clear what I am trying to say so that everybody is able to follow. Uh, the kiss of reconciliation of Luke chapter 15 is what we will look at today. As we know, the theme of the World Council of Churches Assembly is God's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity. Let's look at the context in which we are reading this text. In the context of brokenness and shattered lives around us. Bruised relationships within several families around us. There are crushed communities fighting within, including religious communities, the clash within communities and communities thirsting for reconciliation are around us. There are peoples fighting peoples, not about big wars, but again, there are small conflicts that are happening in several parts of the world. Nations at war with themselves, nations at war with each other. Now we are also very familiar with wars at our doorsteps. Humanity has been at war with nature and the kind of climate crisis that we live with again calls for this whole idea of reconciliation. Technology that is losing its human touch all across, all around us is happening. Reconciliation is the greatest need of humanity today. And it is in this context, the churches together are going to come together and ask this question. How does God's love invite us to reconciliation? What should we do for reconciliation? What are the practical things the world needs today? Would be the question that we would be looking at. As we look at that question, let us look also at the text. The text, Luke chapter 15, talks about God's love. As we know, the text has three stories. One is the story of the lost coin. The other is the story of the lost sheep. And the third is the story of the lost son. And in these stories, we realize the nature of God's love. Jesus himself is telling his disciples about a God whose love has no boundaries. A God whose love does not give up on setbacks. The sheep was lost. The son was lost. But in that setback, in that lostness, the love of the father is the love that keeps waiting for the son to come back, for the son to return and reconcile. It is about the love that seeks restoration with hope because all these stories ends with good news, hope of restoration and reconciliation. And all these stories has the story of the love of God that rejoices with the neighbors and is constantly inviting. Now let, let, let us take a closer look 
as and the story. You know, as we know, relationship is the core of love. Whenever we do a confirmation class, the first lesson we go through is our father. And we talk about why the use of the word father. Well, Jesus also talks about a father and two sons and home as a basic unit of the expression of God's love. When I say that, I'm aware that there is a patriarchal bias here. Only the man and the two sons are there. Personal exceptions are there because for several people, father is not a very good image of love. But despite that, here is a home which is supposed to be an epitome of love. And in that love is one son lost. Now, the first question that I would want to draw your attention to as we prepare for this Bible study is this. Why do we want to talk about reconciliation? We talk about reconciliation because conflicts has happened. Relationship has been affected. There has been estrangement. People are far away, far apart from each other. And when we ask this question, why? And ask the question from the text that we heard read, we realize a few things. One, here is a paradigm shift from the hour to the mind. As we grow up in a home till today, it is our property. It is our home. It is our, us, and we. And suddenly one day, one of the sons come and ask, give me mine. I, me, mine, instead of ours. Well, the bottomless pit of consumerism, selfishness, human greed, how we interpret it, though this might look as a natural process of asking for one's property, here is one important reality we must understand. And that reality is this, when mine, my interests, my needs, my priorities, my comfort comes over the other, my profit, my gain comes as a priority over community affairs, their estrangement begins. And then what does he do? He gathers together everything. You know, this gathering together is another very, very important word. When we look around the world today, we find this happening in different manifestations, the gathering together. Why do you want to destroy creation? Why do you want to destroy the world that the next generation should inherit? This attitude of gathering, this attitude of consumption is part of life. And then the third important word in that particular passage is distance. He gathered everything and traveled to a faraway land moving away, estrangement. The family was together and suddenly the estrangement begins. He goes away, goes away to a faraway land. And this distance is a reality in several, several lives today. Intentionally or unintentionally, people are having a big distance between themselves. It happens at several levels. And when we read uh, Ibsen, his Doll's House, a famous novel, the main two characters, they were in love. And that was a beautiful expression of love till then. But at one point, the central character, Dora, asks her partner this question. I think there is a big abyss, a big hole that is coming between us. No relationship. You could be two people together, but there's a big distance happening between people. This rela relationship estrangements happen quite a lot. And that is where we talk about reconciliation. This has happened between parents and children. This has happened between life partners. This has happened between communities. This has happened between nations. This has happened between clusters of nations. Distance, distance coming up between people. And then the next word that we read in the passage is also important. Squandering everything in dissolute living. 
you know, re when relationships are broken, it's not only relationship that are squandered, but what we have, everything that we have is being squandered and irresponsible living. We talk about reconciliation because of irresponsible living of people. We talk about a war because whatever be, whatever be the justification you make for a war, a war is surely an irresponsible act. Whatever be the irresponsible squandering of Earth's resources that we do, however we try to justify it, it is an irresponsible act, squandering act, squandering lifestyle. And therefore, when we talk about reconciliation, we are talking about the lostness of humanity. It could be in personal relationships, it could be in family relationship, it could be in relationship within communities, between communities, nations, or clusters of nations. This is also a reality in churches, conflicts within churches, conflict among churches, the church union movements. Yes, it's the World Council of Churches going to meet, but there again, quite a lot of conflict of interest happening. And therefore the theme, reconciliation, a God of love inviting people for reconciliation is something that we should very seriously ask. What is this reconciliation we are talking about? What is God's love that we are actually talking about? When we continue to read the text, we realize that the condition of lostness of the person, at the situation in which the son who was far away expresses himself, or how Jesus paints him. If you are asked to paint the prodigal son, you know, Jesus uses words to paint that person's condition. Friends, that is the condition of several people around us. The gospel lesson that we re read uses some words to paint it. What are those words? The first word is famine. Okay? A famine. There is no food around. Mother Teresa once said, the greatest famine in the world today is the hunger not for food or water, but for love. The hunger for love, the famine for love in loneliness, in cloistered relationships. Jesus paints a famine first. After painting the famine, he talks about this man. He was in need. He was in want. A man who lived in prosperity now has squandered everything, nothingness, his lostness, the lost state of mind, nothing, he has nothing. The third word he uses is, so he sold himself, he hired himself to a person who was looking at, who had maybe a big business in the neighborhood and was sent to fend for pigs. That particular community did not like pigs. And therefore, serving the pigs was supposed to be one of the lowest estates that a person could go into. Only if he had nothing else would, to do, would that person opt to feed the pigs. And that exactly was what happened. And then, as he was feeding the pig, pigs, he did not even have the pots of the pigs. Nobody even gave them to eat. You see, it's a few words. But Jesus is painting a picture of the lostness of the person. A person who needed to reconcile with God. A person who needed to reconcile with his father. A person who, was, who needed to reconcile with his home. A person who was in need of reconciliation. Friends, these words explain life's realities of several people and several communities around us. And that's the relevance of the World Council of Churches' theme. God's love sees this famine around us. See people in need. See people who are, who are having to sell themselves. See people having to do things which they think are not worth their dignity. Not even getting the pots of pigs to eat. The pain and agony of the people that leads to lo loneliness and lostness. Though this is a story, a parable said by Jesus about the love of God, 
it paints the picture of several people around us in our church, in our pews, in our porticos, and outside. And therefore, as churches together in Freiburg, in baden württemberg when we try to host the global church, global church trying to talk about this very important theme of reconciliation, it is good that in preparation, in pilgrimage towards the assembly, we are able to look at these themes very, very carefully. Now, the journey to reconciliation. Now, that's, that, is, that are the practical steps towards reconciliation. I would just draw a few words from the story of the return of the sun for us to really look at practically what does it mean today. When we talk about reconciliation, what does these words mean today would be one question. For, for us to remember, I've just tried to put all these words starting with one letter, R. That is just for us to really uh, look at these, these steps carefully. The first is the realization. And the Bible says, when he came to his senses, well, when he was gathering, when he was spending, when he was quandering, when he was uh, far away living the life as he wished, he did not really seriously think about implications. He did not think about the consequences. But sometimes when we think about the consequences, it becomes very late. The good news is that when the churches are coming together to talk about reconciliation, before it is too late. The realization that we need to come to our senses at least now, now before it is too late, to really see what reconciliation is what reconciliation implies, what reconciliation means. So the, the Bible, Jesus says, this man came to his senses. And then what happened? There is a revelation. In my father's home, you see, I, I like the word, my father. Now he was talking about, give me mine and going away from the father's home. And suddenly he realizes, it is still my father's home. In my father's home, there are several hired servants. All of them have enough bounty and there are leftovers. And here am I dying. Here am I in a situation that is pathetic. So he realizes in that reality, he reveals unto himself the father's home, the father's home of love, the father's home of fullness. Well, primarily, the church is called to look at several people who stay far away from God the Father. Far away. And do not even think about the Father's home because they have not reached the situation of famine when we look at the outside. But the spiritual famine that people are going through, the agony that people are going through, especially at the last moments of their life, is inexplicable. The third is a resolution. He decides, I will arise and go to my father's house. At some point of life, there is a resolution. Enough is enough. I cannot allow life to drift away any further. I cannot allow myself to go down the drain any further. I must arise from this particular place where I have fallen into. I must get up. I must arise. And I must arise. And what do I do when I arise? I must have a destination. I must have an aim. I must have a place to go. And that is my father's house. And that's why the theme says, God's love invites you to reconciliation. My father's home is an inviting place. However far away I drift away, however far away I go away, my father's home remains an inviting space. God's love keeps inviting. God's love keeps inviting. Jesus was underlying that point when he is explaining that parable. At Karl Ruhe, the WCC assembly, we will underline that again. God's love is inviting us. Inviting us to a life of reconciliation, even when children are going drifting away, young people are drifting away, 
families are drifting away, communities are drifting away. A resolution, I will not allow my life to drift away. I will get up, get up out of the ghetto and I will walk. I will walk to my father's house. The next very important aspect of reconciliation is repentance. He looks at his life and accepts, I have lived a life that should, have, should not have been the way I have lived. I have done things I should not have done. I have not done things I should have done. And all that he puts in one particular sentence. Jesus beautifully explains that. I have sinned against you, O my Father, and also against heaven. I have sinned against you, I have sinned against heaven. Repentance is that you turn. Going away from God, at one point you decide to come back to God. That wonderful experience of coming back to God is what is happening in that particular, particular passage that Jesus explains. And then is the recognition. I am not worthy to be called your son. It is not big claims that I want to make when I come back. But I only say grace, grace alone. It is only through grace shall I be accepted back. I be returning back. And therefore, he says, I am not worthy to be called your son. There's new light that comes into his path. So the journey of reconciliation begins with there. There is a revelation, there is a resolution, there is repentance, there is recognition. The story goes on. There is the returning. Many people think about this, I must one day repent. I must one day get up. When life is not going the way it should be, but tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow procrastination. Here in this story, this man does not procrastinate. This man does not keep it for tomorrow. He arose and went to his father. And that exactly is what the World Council of Churches would be calling for. We need to arise from the ghettos into which we have fallen. We have to return, return to God and in one of the assemblies in the early years, we discussed this. Turn to God, rejoice in hope. Turn to God, rejoice in hope. Brazil reverberated with this theme. What does this returning mean? The Porto Alegre Assembly discussed that with about 4,000, 5,000 people coming together. What does it mean? And this time, we would say returning is important for reconciliation. Returning is important for reconciliation. And then what happens? There is this reception. There is this reception. The father saw him from a great distance, ran, hugged him in one of the painting competitions. The theme given was father's love and the story of the prodigal son. Now the painter did not do much. It, it, it was a very modern painting. Do you know what he did? He had two window bars. And in holding one window bar was one hand. Perhaps an elderly person hand. That's all the painting had. And there was a caption. The caption was, could that be my son? And down in the alley was a pathway that went down from the window. And at the end of the pathway was a small spot. And that is the father's love, waiting for the son to return, waiting for the son to return, or rather running to the son, hugging the son, the reception, the receiving back. That is the hope. That is the joy that we talk about when we talk about reconciliation. The reconciliation the symbol of reconciliation is what I started with. He hugged him and kissed him. And that kiss for me is the sender of the story. People, they were once together loving, but for some reason they got estranged. 
went to far distances. A couple of weeks ago, I shared a story of a new movie that has come out. And it is about two lovers almost deciding to marry. But then a small difference of opinion happened and they got estranged. A few days later, one of them decided to marry somebody else. And that marriage, the previous day, they had a conversation between the previous lovers. A few days later, the second person also got married. Life went on. And after a few years, they meet again. And they meet again, and with the same love in their eyes, they ask a question to each other. Well, we remember the day when we had a conflict. The girl or the boy says, on that day, evening, if I had come to you and said sorry, if I had hugged you and kissed you, wouldn't our lives have been very different from what it is today? Something stopped us from that hug. Something stopped us from that kiss. Friends, reconciliation is the hugging of estranged communities. Reconciliation is the kissing together of people and communities who have gone astray, who have started hating each other. And that is a gospel mandate, a gospel challenge. After this, there is the restoration that happens. The father says, let the best of the clothes be now bought. This man should have been in racks because from a famished land, from among the pigs, is he coming back? He would have even sold everything, including his ring. A sandalless, ringless, poorly clad man stands there and the father restores him into the joy of the home. The best of the clothes, a ring and sandals. With each of these words, we can keep going on. Perhaps when we talk about reconciliation, we will do that. And then is the rejoicing. He said that the fatted cow, that the fatted cow be brought. Let there be celebration. And the translation that Christine read said, let us have a party. Let us celebrate. Now, fatted cows are special cows that are fattened for happy occasions. Perhaps right from the day the younger son went away, there was no happy occasion in the family. And the cow was eating and getting fattened and fattened and fattened. And now is the time for rejoicing in the home. Time of rejoicing in the home. Celebration in the home. And then there is a reflection from the father. This my son was lost. But now I am found. And that is reconciliation. This my son was dead. But is alive now. What we thought was over, we have a new beginning. What we thought was the omega point, we are able to have another alpha point. Friends, that is the hope the global church will have when we come together to Karlsruhe to talk about reconciliation. Talk about God's love that invites us to reconciliation. God's love that invites us to get up, repent, to return, to rejoice, to reconcile, to restore. We therefore, as the hosting community, will have our eyes opening far beyond we can understand, our ears opening far beyond we can comprehend, our hearts opening to global reality of pain, strife, conflict, distance between people. The story also gives us a warning. That warning is the human nature that fails to appreciate this love. Here is the other son. He comes and sees the celebration. He comes and sees the reconciliation. But he was angry. And that is a reality we'll have to live with. People who would be angry within ourselves with reconciliation. When we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about healing of memories, when we talk about justice, when we talk about a new beginning, people would still be pointing fingers at the past. Mistakes of the past, crimes of the past, memories of the past. 
Yes, some of those memories bring to us anger, memories of exploitation, memories of how communities were destroyed, first peoples were killed, memories of how pain happened around the squandering of everything that happened. He refused to go in. And that refusal to go in, we will find around us. There was a church leader who went and prayed when the war began. And now there are many of us, many people around who will come to Karlsruhe saying, if that church leader who prayed for a war is present in a room, I will not come in. This refusal to go in is not a story that will be heard thousands of years ago from Jesus' mouth. We will have people angry. We will have people refusing to go in. We will have people complaining about the behavior of the church. About the behavior of the church. There are several stories of pain happening about sexual exploitation, exploitation of nature, memories that cannot be easily reconciled, where reconciliation is going to be a hard question of justice. We have to acknowledge the elder son. Jesus puts the words into his, into his mouth saying, the father's mouth saying, well, you are always with me, my son. But this man, this my son, was dead, is alive again. He was lost. We are getting back again. There is no person who would be... That was the position that the church took. There is nobody whose life we can take away, not giving an opportunity to restore to a right relationship. To re now, uh, so that's, that's the context in which, because my time uh, uh, should be up there allowing for questions and discussion. But yeah, God's love invites us to reconciliation. That's why I started uh, saying this. You know, we read this in the context of broken and shattered lives. Bruised relationships within families, crushed communities, peoples fighting peoples, nations at war with each other, humanity at war with nature, technology that is losing the human touch. Reconciliation is a great need that the churches together need to look at. And we will do exactly that in Karlsruhe. So therefore, when we talk about the kiss of reconciliation, God kissing lost humanity. But more than that, we are basically looking at this question. How can broken relationships be restored? Despite the anger, despite the questions that are being asked, how do we restore broken relationships? And when nature joins in the kiss of restoration, the whole question of the climate justice and climate debates comes around it. We will meet at Karlsruhe. 31st of August, the meeting would begin. Till the 8th of September, it will go on. Before that, there will be quite a lot of pre-assemblies happening. Young people are meeting, women are meeting. Quite a lot of meetings happening around us. Workshops will be happening. General public will be happening. People will be coming to worship together. But as we join in this pilgrimage, we are joining as the global church comes to our neighborhood. As we reflect on God's goodness across the years. And we look forward for a future with hope based on the values of God. And in that looking forward, a very important, two very important things. One is reconciliation. The other is unity. A divided church cannot, cannot be a powerful witness. 